Greetings all. Welcome to the Emerald Choral Academy. I am Gary Cannon, the Artistic Director of the Emerald Ensemble, a professional choir based in Seattle. The Emerald Choral Academy is a series of interactive webinars during which our area's leading professional choristers reveal their personal tricks of the trade to community singers. These webinars are then made available freely to singers across the world via YouTube. Today is the fifth session of the second semester of the Emerald Choral Academy. The Emerald Ensemble is very grateful to our generous donors and organizations who have made this project possible, including For Culture and the Seattle Office of Arts and Culture. We encourage anyone participating or viewing this webinar to make a donation as you are able at emeraldensemble.org. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and join our mailing list to hear about future sessions of the Academy and the other activities of the Emerald Ensemble. A bit later, I'll put links to those items in the chat. This webinar is being recorded by participating, you are granting the Emerald Ensemble permission to share your contributions. Your microphones and cameras will remain off for the duration of the presentation. You can ask questions to the presenter by typing into the chat or the Q&A features at the bottom of the screen. Either of those features works equally well. Uh, and then periodically, I will interject to field your questions to our presenter. And today's instructor is bass baritone J. Scott Kovacs. Scott is one of Seattle's most prominent choral musicians, active as a chorister, a soloist, conductor, administrator, board member, festival coordinator, voice teacher, and executive director of both the Medieval Women's Choir and the Emerald Ensemble. If you sing in a Seattle area choir, then I guarantee you that you owe thanks to Scott for something. He won't even know what it is, but I guarantee you that true. And on top of all that, he happens to be one of the very kindest souls you will ever meet. And Scott's topic today is everyday vocal health. It's a pleasure to introduce to you my friend and colleague, Scott Kovacs. Thank you, my friend and colleague, Gary Cannon. Um, it's, a, it's an absolute joy to be back um, doing another one of these uh, Choral Academy presentations, these webinars for all of you. Um, I think I know almost everyone on the attendee list, although I have to say we have folks from as far away as the UK um, and the East Coast of the United States um, uh, in our um, uh, in our guest list today. So uh, with that, I'm going to uh, attempt to share screen and get things started. Uh, that won't work, Scott, will it? Let's go back to here where it actually says share screen. And let's try that. Um, <clears throat> uh, that went through. I'm, I, I'm glad it worked too. Um, one quick word of uh, it's not caution, it's uncaution. Um, I There will be one slide um, that is that shows parts of the human uh, anatomy, uh, vocal anatomy. I will warn you before we get there, so if you're squeamish, you can look away. Um, <clears throat> um, but I've taken out most of, uh, th there aren't many other images. At the end of the presentation, if there's time, I have a couple of great YouTube videos that show the human uh, vocal mechanism in action. Um, so you can either uh, uh, stay tuned for those or look away, or um, I just wanted to make sure that for people that are a little squeamish, there isn't a whole lot of um, um, uh, content that might uh, be uncomfortable for you. But I'll warn you when we get to the one slide. So with that, I will begin with my disclaimer. All the information in this presentation is intended to be informational. It is not intended for the purpose of diagnosing or treating medical disorders. The Emerald Coral Academy is not responsible for conditions that required a licensed professional for diagnosis or treatment. If you are experiencing symptoms that might require a diagnosis, seek medical attention. And we'll talk more about um, when it's time to seek medical attention for your, uh, for your voice. Um, a little further in the presentation. So um, just a little sort of 
look ahead into um, what the about this presentation. So um, uh, Gary listed my many hats, um, among which um, include that I, I consider myself a vocal pedagogist um, and uh, even uh, to some extent a vocal scientist. What we mean by vocal pedagogy, pedagogy is the physics, the physiology, and the psychology of the human voice. And with more, uh, with increasing importance, we talk more about the neurology of singing. Um, uh, Heidi Moss Erickson, San Francisco Conservatory of Music, is pioneering a field called neuroped, where we really look at the neurology of, of how we teach singing um, to other people and uh, how we sing. What I will not be covering today are major vocal disorders, um, uh, with the exception of laryngitis. I will talk about laryngitis um, about halfway through the presentation. I don't want everyone leaving the presentation and Googling a bunch of symptoms and running into um, and, and experiencing or, 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 or needing advice right away. Um, uh, if you, uh, again, we'll cover you know, when to talk to your, your medical professional, but I'm not gonna cover major medical vocal disorders uh, in this, uh, in this uh, presentation. I'm gonna try to avoid lingo. Um, pedagogists love their nerd terms and to use terminology. I'm gonna try to keep it fairly straightforward, but it, if something slips out that, you, that doesn't make sense or or if I've lingoed the conversation today, please ask in the um, in the chat, and I'll try to clarify a term uh, that that may not might not be so um, easily understood. I also want to stress that you are your own best expert. We all know our own bodies well. We all know when something's wrong. We all know when we need rest. We all know um, uh, when something doesn't seem right or when everything's going great. Uh, in terms of our body. So uh, be your own best expert um, uh, in evaluating uh, where your voice is at and what you might need for vocal health. Everything here are recommendations and guidelines. There's not rules um, because everybody is different. Your body is different. Your mind is different. Your, um, your relationship to singing is different from person to person. There are some characteristics that are the same. So we talk about these, re these as recommendations in general terms, but there, there are not any rules here uh, that are hard and fast. And then lastly, nothing replaces a relationship with your medical professionals, uh, uh, not even Google, uh, especially not Google. The um, having a good primary care physician, one that knows you sing or play an instrument, and two, uh, having somewhere in your Rolodex, do people still have Rolodexes? Is that still a thing? Uh, the name of a good ENT, uh, otolaryngologist, uh, is, is a good idea. The, um, uh, if you're looking for recommendations about ENTs in town, the presentation before mine by Ryan Beatty has um, on our website uh, um, a handout that has some great names uh, of, for referring to ENTs in town. First, let's talk about vocal health and voice professionals in particular. So the first um, uh, thing I wanna stress is that we talk about vocal care in sort of a, um, a tri there's sort of a triangle of care that, that medical professional that with the most specific and most specialized and highly trained knowledge is the ear, nose and throat doctor otolaryngologists, and these are special. These are doctors with a specialty that deal with uh, conditions of the head, neck, and um, and the voice. In particular, laryngologists will know the most about uh, vocal con vo uh, conditions of the voice. When you seek um, help from an ENT or advice or um, support from a uh, from an ENT, tell them you sing. It is very important for those medical professionals to know that you're a singer. The second is the speech and language pathologist. An SLP is a clinician that assesses, diagnoses, and treats speech, language, social communication, cognitive communication, and swallowing disorders. It's a very, very highly specialized um, profession, and we are grateful for their work uh, 
I uh, am very fortunate to have several SLPs in the orbit of my studio practice and uh, uh, I'm grateful to partner with them for, uh, for when I'm working with students that are receiving care from a speech language pathologist. And then lastly is the voice teacher or the voice professional. Uh, this person is trained in teaching vocal pedagogy, repertoire, and technique. They don't diagnose illnesses. They can't treat uh, um, disorders of the voice. Only those other professionals can do that. We can partner with those other professionals in supporting how you learn to sing or learn to sing again after a course of treatment or diagnosis. And we will often refer you to um, a medical professional uh, if we feel like there's something going on with the voice that needs medical attention or diagnosis. <clears throat> Excuse me, and I'm gonna clear my throat even though I know I shouldn't uh, uh, cough when I clear my throat. The times to seek professional help, in other words, get see your primary care physician or get a referral to an ENT is when it hurts. It's, so there are generally two kinds of pain that I, that I talk about with, with my voice students in my studio practice. There's sharp pain and dull pain. Sharp pain is almost always relative to some sort of injury, uh, relative to some sort of injury. Uh, that's probably a go to the doctor moment for you. Um, and then dull pain is sort of an ache. It's like when you um, have exercised for a long time, overused the voice, maybe you've had a three and a half or a four hour rehearsal with an orchestra. Um, that's an example of dull pain. Uh, it's sort of an ache, uh, tightness in the throat. Um, that generally will be, if it goes away in 24 hours, a few days, it's okay. If it lasts longer, maybe a red flag goes up. If it lasts more than three weeks, you should already have seen your doctor. Um, uh, which, which is what I mean by when it persists. When it won't get better or goes or go away, it's time to go see your, your medical professional. Um, uh, I just was uh, chatting with a colleague yesterday uh, who said you know, their, their student was having this, this uh, symptom for three weeks. And I'm like, oh, absolutely. Three weeks is already almost too long to, to wait to go see the doctor. The other one where I would say is a must go, do not pass go, are sudden changes to the voice, um, particularly loss of range. If you lose range, if you lose power, those are things where I would um, refer you to medical uh, attention right away. If something is unpredictable, um, it's another uh, uh, sign that you should seek uh, medical attention for, uh, for, the, the voc for the voice. Uh, for example, um, you can't rely on your range. You can't rely on registration changes um, that, that can't be improved with, um, with technique or with voice lessons. Also, if something is going on that's preventing you from enjoying singing, uh, whether that's physiological or psychological, um, it is probably time to seek uh, the attention of, of, a, of, a prof of a voice professional medical professional, someone who can help you with, with those symptoms. And then anytime you think you need medical attention, I'm, 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 I'm not saying, you know, every time you stub your toe, go to the doctor for your, for your voice, but I am saying if, it, if you feel like you need the medical attention, get it checked out. This is a knowing your body, knowing your voice moment. Oh, I'm gonna back up. Next slide, might gross you out a little bit, uh, uh, you can look away for a couple of minutes. Um, we'll, um, um, I'll let you know when it's safe to look back. The, um, these are images of healthy versus unhealthy vocal folds. So we'll look at the left side first. These are healthy vocal cords, uh, vocal folds, vocal cords. We use them somewhat interchangeably. Um, this is the true vocal, vocal fold or vocal cords right here. These are the false cords. There's a little pocket of air underneath these. Um, and uh, so this, by the way, right here is the front of the throat. This part right here, the Adams, the uh, um, uh, larynx, front of the larynx is right here. Uh, this is in the adducted position. This is when they're closed. And this is in the abducted position. This is when they're open. The cricothyroid cartilages, the arytenothyroid cartilages have pulled um, the, the vocal folds into the uh, um, abducted position. 
so that there's so this is likely phonation and this is likely respiration here so this is healthy the tissue is pink it's the vocal folds themselves are white in appearance this is because of the um, epithelial cells and the cartilage uh, the collagen that um, uh, that is part of the uh, proprio lamina tissues um, here and these white folds um, uh, uh, these, these, this white material actually encompasses the vo vocalis muscle itself, which is um, that, um, that bit of tissue that stretches and, and thickens uh, to create pitch uh, when it's in the adducted position. Now, there are two different looks here at unhealthy vocal folds. This one on top is due to a viral condition. This could be a cold. This could be um, the flu. It could be any number of uh, viral and uh, viral caused infections. But what you have here is hypervascularity, which means there's a lot of swelling or edema in the tissue. And you can see how the very, very thin, clean edge of these vocal folds meets in order to create the vibration. When, um, when there's swelling in the vocal folds like there is here, those folds don't meet evenly. There's a lot of air passing through the swelling. I would say that this person's probably feeling a lot of discomfort. Um, this is a person who should not be singing much, if at all. Uh, and this vocal fold is actually injured. This is what a hemorrhage looks like in the vocal fold. Um, this person has an injured voice and will probably be on vocal rest for some period of time. All right, it's safe to look back. I'm going to move on. So now, in terms of um, everyday vocal health, um, uh, the actual practices and, um, and habits that you will need for uh, maintaining vocal health, the most important thing I can tell you is you should warm up and cool down your voice before singing activity. Cool downs are something new. We haven't been talking about those a lot uh, until recently. But uh, it's just like when you go to the gym, you stretch a little bit before you start, start lifting, before you take that jog or that walk around Green Lake, you're gonna stretch out your hammies, you're gonna stretch out your calves a little bit. And then um, if you're running around Green Lake, once you're done with that three and a half miles, you might walk for about half a block just to let things cool down. The same is true with the voice. It's all, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the muscle systems, the subsystems of the, of, of the larynx, uh, the throat, uh, are, all, are all muscles. And in some cases, they're very small muscles. So it's important to make sure that we're, we're, we're stretching those out and giving them a chance to, um, uh, giving the proteins a chance to line up correctly in and to um, get the blood flowing, make sure that everything's hydrated and moving well. Glides and slides, highs and lows, Woo, 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 sirens. Uh, start highs and lows. Make sure that you are going across the passagios. Woo. I kind of made a pronounced break there so that you could hear going from uh, the upper register, the upper passagio, the upper, the head voice into the chest voice. So ups and downs. We want to use slides because they stretch the vocal folds. If you are sliding from high to low, you're releasing tension smoothly on the vocal cords. If you start right away with big arpeggios of an octave, don't sing like I do, you are going and you are, you are causing the vocal folds and the, and the vocal mechanism to make uh, um, abrupt and discreet um, uh, motions right away. That's warm up gently from the beginning using highs and lows. We also want to talk about stretching on press just a little bit. So um, the idea is to stretch and then release. Stretch and then release. This is a concept um, put forward by Ingo Tietze, who is the same guy that um, introduced straw phonation. Mm. Mm. Straw phonation is a great and efficient way to warm up. Um, I could talk about how the gas dynamics work. I could talk about um, uh, vocal tract inertance, um, all of the science behind why straw phonation works. 
uh, but it does. Um, it, it's a great it's a great technique, and sometime we'll do an entire workshop on straw phonation. For those of you that didn't miss my introducing the um, uh, the idea of bubble phonation, this is a fancy device that's made strictly for bubble phonation. There's about an inch and a half of water uh, in this, and we're using uh, atmospheric pressure on top of the water to increase the intraoral air pressure so that the vocal folds are working more efficiently. Uh, same is true with this straw. You don't need one of these fancy devices. You can do it with, um, in this case, a cream jar and a, and, a, and a straw. And I've got about an inch and a half of water underneath the straw. Uh, if you're interested in more about that, um, I will be um, happy to do a workshop in the fall. Um, keep different diameters of straws around um, to help you with um, varying air pressure, the intraoral air pressure, uh, when you do those warm-ups. Warm-ups should start and, and cool downs should start and end gently. Uh, a common question that I get is, can I warm up in the car? Absolutely, you can warm up in the car. Just be aware that the acoustic environment is very different than if you're in your living room, in your bathroom, or in your shower. There tends to be a lot of carpet, a lot of absorbing spaces. Um, I tend to t I tell people to sing into the windshield so that you get some auditory feedback um, uh, uh, from uh, that you won't get from the upholstery in your car. When you are singing in the car, be mindful that if you are singing with the radio, which we all often do, uh, that the volume is not too high so that you are not shouting over the um, over the stereo in the car. With all those absorbing surfaces in the car, it's very easy to over sing in the car. I would also recommend doing um, uh, singing gently in the car uh, in, in, in just in, in general. Uh, but yes, you can warm up and cool down in the car. How much warming up, cooling down do I need? It depends. It depends on the job you're about to do as a singer. It depends on your voice. Some of us have voices that take an hour and a half to wake up in the morning. And it takes a lot of, of really uh, creative gymnastics to get the voice working over the various uh, um, uh, registration events in our voice or, or problems that we might be experiencing, smoothing out rough edges in registration events, that sort of thing. Generally, we warm up more than we think we, uh, more than we need to. Um, there is now new science that says we can really warm up the voice in seven minutes. If you're using something like vocal tract inertness or semi-occluded vocal tract um, postures to warm up your voice, you can make your warm-ups more efficient. But generally, seven to ten minutes is enough to warm up the voice unless you're in a situation uh, like a voice studio where the voice teacher is working on something very specific and you might have specific exercises. Um, in my studio, sometimes warm-ups last as much as 20 minutes. But uh, the cool down, um, you probably need two to three minutes um, to cool down. And that cooling down can be anything from making chewing noises to more sirens to um, using your, um, your straw phonation or bubbles, um, anything like that. And then one of the things that you can do uh, 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 is vocal fry. Not too much, but a little bit of vocal fry is also a way to help cool down the voice. I'm going to cough again. <clears throat> Excuse me, I do need to clear. Something's coming up. I need to take a quick drink. I want to talk a little bit about the concept of vocal load. So what we mean by vocal load is how much you're tasking the voice to do in any given day. One of the things, uh, one of the complaints that I often get in my studio is, you know, my voice is just so tired at the end of the day. Well, what are you doing? Well, you know, I've got three Zoom meetings in the morning and then, you know, I'm running the kids to soccer. What? what how many hours a day are you speaking? How many hours a day are you singing? And the, the factors, the, the variables that go into that um, are volume, pitch, time, and repetition. If you are singing the fourth movement of Beethoven's Ninth three times in one night, you have a high level of vocal load. 
if you are singing the talus if you love me three times in a rehearsal you have a, a much lower vocal load um, on on your voice that finale to to the beethoven ninth is a screamer and you're shouting over an orchestra um, singing over an orchestra you would never shout over an orchestra you're singing over an orchestra the amount of time that you do all these things are important and uh and the pitch is important higher pitch tends to be a greater stress on the voice because there is a higher subglottal air pressure there's more air going past the vocal folds in a higher volume and the vocal folds are actually moving at a faster um, faster rate so um, the percussion the percussive effect the repeated the repeated percussive effect on the vocal folds is iterated um, under higher pressure uh, and at higher speed why does my voice get so vocal load is something that we should all be examining in our lives if you have a two and a half hour rehearsal on a monday night finding two and a half hours to subtract from your day where you're not using your voice is a great way to budget the um uh the the voice that you have available why does my voice get tired well for that very reason the vocal folds are coming together at a very high rate of speed and under pressure and as they meet over and over and over again the edges um, of the vocal folds do take on um, uh, 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 the effect of it's, it's like clapping if you have ever been to a concert where the encore has gone on for for a very long time and you've been clapping and clapping and clapping and suddenly you realize that your hands are starting to hurt same is true of the vocal folds so that's why the voice gets tired it just gets tired from from use and it's not just the vocal folds it's the other muscles that um uh, that regulate and help support the subsystems of the voice uh, it's important to consider your job rehearsal this is, goes to budgeting your your um your vocal load job rehearsal performances zoom boom um i'll talk a little bit about um, um zoom boom there is a tendency to um, uh, speak very loudly at our computers all day long uh, while we're while we're in our Zoom meetings or our Zoom rehearsals or our Zoom lessons. I'm certainly guilty of it. There are um, some ways to help reduce that. If you have um, a pair of uh, open back microphone um, uh, headphones, for example, these happen to have built into them um a uh, a microphone that can help um feed sound into your ears so that you're getting some feedback uh, about the volume of your voice these will also for example plug into my yeti microphone so that i know exactly how loudly i'm speaking during a voice lesson and it helps reduce zoom boom just a little bit the performance aspect if you've got a gig coming up um it makes sense to rest your voice a little bit my my rule is to subtract the number of hours that i have to sing from the number of hours that i'm speaking in that day and that's that's uh, a, it's a rule of thumb um but it I, it changes uh with rehearsal it's not so much um uh rehearsals there's a little bit of talking there's breaking there's more opportunity for warm-up there's a lot of other things that go into that but the job is also very important. I have several several people in my voice studio who teach at uh, school at varying levels. At least one of those people um, teaches uh, little uh, kindergartner, uh, kindergartners and preschoolers, and she's very much at the top of her voice all day long with those with those littles. So her vocal fatigue by the time her vocal load is much higher and her vocal fatigue is higher by the time she gets to her voice lesson at six o'clock. And that's something that we need to calculate into her, into her voice lessons every week. Um, high, high and loud for too long. If you're going to the Huskies game, um, you know, you're going to be, uh, or the Sounders game, you're going to be high and loud for too long. If you're singing Beethoven's ninth four times in a day, you're going to be high and loud for too long. If you are on a road trip in the car singing with the radio and you're blasting and you're singing along, it's going to be high and loud for too long. Those are things that will contribute to vocal load. 
the brass ring of vocal load is maintaining your vocal efficiency, which means vibrancy, resonance, and flow, making sure that you're breathing when you speak. When you're in a Zoom meeting, are you sitting up? Do you have your breath underneath the voice at all times? Resonance, are you using the resonating chambers uh, from, from the neck up to amplify your voice effectively? And vibrancy, are your vowel placements efficient? Are you speaking in a manner that, that, will, that will cause you to need higher subglottal air pressure? Is there too much chiaroscuro in the voice? Are you, are you using efficient vowel placement to keep the tone forward? Scott, so can I pause you here for a couple of questions? Yep, absolutely, Gary. Okay, yeah, uh, there's some magnificent questions have come in. Some I'm going to um, hold until oh, I will render myself visible. There we go. Uh, some of the, the questions I'm going to hold um, for later because I think you may answer them later. Uh, but these are very specific to, to what you mentioned already. One thing was a question you posed. Uh, I did some research. Yes, Rolodexes still exist, and you can still purchase Rolodex stuff. How weird a world is it? Um, uh, regarding uh, cool down, is this something that you're uh, saying would happen exclusively after singing? And if so, what uh, what activities are different to cool downs than to warm-ups is there a specific uh, distinction um you know cool downs can happen anywhere that you need them so if you've just i mean let's say you're in a for choral directors that are in the room um uh or for anyone uh, for that matter if there's if you've just finished a, a barn burner of a piece in you've, you've done den all this flesh uh sp discuss uh from from the from the brahms requiem um uh and uh, the choirs, it, 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 you've had an intense rehearsal on that. You could do a cool down in the middle of the rehearsal just to bring the voice back down, to reset registration, to reset um, uh, um, uh, registration events to get the voice calmed down again. What was the second half of that question? Um, if there's a different type of activity for cooling down versus warming up, you said a little bit about that. Is, are there others that one, uh, other theories or, or is, is the physiology well, of it different from one? You're basically, I mean, you're taking the car, you're slowing, you're, go, you're going, you're just slowing the car down and taking the gears down um, as, as, as you go. So I would, again, use things like glides. I would use humming sounds. I would use semi-occluded vocal tract postures. Mm, NG, hum. Anything that that um, uh, uh, that feels like the beginning of a warm up would be a great way to cool down. Oh, that's a good way to think of it. Yeah. Uh, when you're doing with a straw phonation, the question was asked, and I don't know that I fully understood it, but but you might uh, as to whether you can have too much back pressure. Guessing that's returning right, so from let's, the... let's let's talk about the word back pressure just a little right. bit because we're um, um, I think I, I, I what 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 Tietze calls it is vocal tract inertance or intraoral air pressure. So um, uh, and I'm one of those people that that used the word back pressure for for a very very long time. But what we're what we're really looking for is is to make the um, the air pressure in the mouth closer to the uh to balancing the air pressure that's subglottal so you know intraoral or suprapharyngeal air pressure versus subglottal air pressure so um uh i think the point at which you have too much back pressure is because you've closed both your nose and your mouth and you're trying to phonate oh, oh, oh. The, as long as as long as the the vellum remains in a position where you can have um, air coming out the nose, you can't have too much intraoral air pressure. I don't think the anatomy will actually let you do that. One of the things that we talk about, particularly with bubble phonation, is that it is almost impossible to harm yourself vocally. You would have to you would have to do bubble phonation for our upon hour upon hour in order to have too much of of that of that kind of phonation it's relatively safe and i guess the indicator for me would be are you uncomfortable is 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 there pain is there is there vocal discomfort 
that's always the first indication something is wrong. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, I, I, as far as I understand, if it didn't, then the person who asked that, feel free to, to add a, a clarifier and we can come back to it. Uh, let's, let's move on, Scott. Thank you very much. Okay, great. All right. Uh, what am I doing here? Where am I going back to? What am I doing, Gary? How do I do this? What am I doing? Okay, we're going back to here. All right. Sharing screen again? Yeah. All right. I figured it out. Vocal rest. Uh, let's talk about vocal rest. Sleep is your best help, best defense, and best healing. Uh, having good sleep hygiene. Some of us uh, struggle with sleep hygiene. Some of us are, have a terrible time with insomnia or other sort of rest um, uh, issues, sleep issues. Scott, we may be seeing actually your, uh, your p within PowerPoint rather than the full share. Um, we're um, also seeing the next slide stuff and a few other icons. Well, how about that? So why don't I do this? Um... Oh, sorry about that. It may also just not be a problem. I didn't I didn't know if you want to see us or let, no. let us see what's up next. No, it's better. It's better for. I mean, I'm not particularly. But now I have to figure out. Oh, see, I moved a little thing here. There we go. How is that now? Are we better? Uh, that's it. Right. And, and actually, um, if we if I can ask one other thing before going on, we had a follow up about the straw um, the, and, and the, 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 the back pressure, uh, as they termed it. Uh, and it's uh, the question then uh, I'm going to just read directly. Uh, when I do my straw exercises, I find I need to narrow the straw when I go higher. If I include the straw even more, I can use a whole lot of core strength. Is there a point where that becomes risky? What a great question. And the answer, you know, I, I mean, I do keep multiple diameters of straw um, available for different techniques. And I have to think about the answer to that question. Can we hold on to that to the end of the presentation? Maybe my brain will have come up with the answer by the time we get there. Of course, I'll, I'll remind you. Don't worry about it. Thanks. Let's do that. Um, so vocal rest. Oh, here we go. This is the one. Sleep is your best help, your best defense, and your best healing. Uh, I think we talked about that. The myth of total vocal rest. So first of all, if you are getting, if you if you are on vo total vocal rest, no talking, no singing, nothing, that probably should be coming from your physician or your ENT. Um, uh, Total vocal rest is a myth in that in order for the tissues, which are called fast twitch tissues, um, in the vocal mechanism to heal correctly, the proteins and the, the, um, the tissues have to orient themselves correctly, and they can only do that if they're being used. It's like physical, it's like when you go to physical, you have an injury, you go to physical therapy, you have to use the the muscle systems in physical therapy the same is true for your voice now you can reduce the amount of of of, of load dramatically and only use it um, as you need it uh, uh, but uh, total vocal rest is not necessarily the best medicine um, uh, when you are uh, recovering if you are sick if you have laryngitis, if you have some other aphonia or dysphonia that's that's being caused by illness or injury, um, and it hurts, then it's it's probably a good idea to reduce um, altogether uh, using using your voice. Uh, again, get a medical professional's advice before total vocal rest um, in general. Don't skip your warm ups and cool downs. Um, if you are uh, in vocal rest and you can phonate a little bit or if you're feeling like you need to rest the voice, do your, do your, your warm ups and your cool downs alongside your seatmates in choir. Um, use semi occluded vocal tract exercises and postures when you are, when you are using the voice less. Talk a little bit about whispering. Whispering is a no. If you are, um, if you are uh, resting your voice from injury or illness, 
whispering um, needs, in order for whispering to function, um, the way whispering works is you're getting medial compression on the vocal fold, uh, which is exactly the point at which the vocal fold is probably irritated or injured. So whispering is a bad idea. Uh, it's better to lower the volume, but but uh, enough, uh, but but to have complete phonation, um, to have actual phonation when you are um, uh, on vocal rest and needing to communicate with your voice. Uh, some things to do when you're on vocal rest. Uh, this is from the voice science folk, the, the, the incredible vocologists at Voice Science Works. Uh, it's a fantastic website. I'll share it with you in a little bit. They call it dry practicing. Um, each inhale and vowel shape preparation for the beginning of each phrase. By the way, you should always breathe in through the vowel you're about to sing. That is, that is the uh, mantra of, of my voice studio. Breathe in through the vowel you're about to sing. Practice your inhalations. Practice your breath timing. Mouthing or speaking lyrics with connection and inflection. Higher phrases and octave down. This is a great technique. I wish more choral conductors used this. Is if you are rehearsing the sopranos on something that is G and A, um, way up up top, drop it down an octave. It reduces the vocal load. Remember that 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 higher pitch increases vocal load. Work on your choreography and staging. Memorization. Oh my gosh, memorization work is great. Playing the melody lines on the piano while thinking the text. Audiation. Hearing the part in your head. And singing each phrase through a straw is another way to practice good vocal rest. Hydration. This is the most important uh, slide in the entire presentation. Um, my rule is to all singers, pee clear. If you are peeing clear, if your urine is straw colored, you are likely, you are likely to be hydrated. Now, I, there, are, there are folks that have, uh, uh, for whom uh, hydration uh, can be a risk. Um, so uh, you know yourself, be mindful of those, but the general rule is pee clear. It takes about 15 or 20 minutes from the time that water goes in, into your mouth for the body to start absorbing the, um, absorbing the water. Uh, and it takes even longer, depending on uh, a lot of other factors, for that water to reach your tissues. Remembering that your vocal folds are two very, very small mechanisms and that drinking, um, uh, drinking a glass of water right before you go out to sing is not going to assist you right away. If you, need to if you have a performance coming up or a big rehearsal coming up, you should be drinking that water hours before you have to go out um, to do that rehearsal or to sing. If you are swallowing water, if you are like, you know, drinking water during rehearsal, you're not hydrating your vocal folds at least not directly. You're, you're moistening the tissues, sure, you're encouraging um, uh, the saliva glands to produce, all of those things are helpful, but that water is not hydrating your vocal folds directly in the course of that rehearsal. So drink pre-game, pre, do your pre-game. Get lots of water into your body before, well, well before you rehearse. Your vocal mechanism dehydrates with use because there's, uh, through exhalation and often with dry air, um, uh, inhalation, um, because we're breathing in through our mouth rather than through our nose, which would normally hydrate and warm um, the air going past our vocal folds. So it's important to stay hydrated. And we exhale a lot of water as a byproduct of respiration, so we're losing water. Some people like to put lemon in their, um, uh, in their drinking water, in their rehearsal water. The acid, uh, the citric acid, actually encourages um, um, the saliva glands to produce, um, so you get a little bit of extra uh, lubrication. Um, herbal teas are great, except that some cause acid reflux or a GI reaction. Um, so again, you know yourself well, um, uh, uh, so choose, choose wisely if you're going to use herbal teas in the course of a rehearsal. Pedialyte, um, oftentimes you will see in my, in my water bottle, it's either blue or orange or um, it's because I've added a little bit of Pedialyte. Pedialyte increases the efficiency of hydration in the body and, um, and adds important things like electrolytes back that you are losing um, uh, as a course of the very athletic business of singing. Nutrition. Um, I want to talk about the, the big one that is on that, that, that sits with every singer. It's the myth about dairy. It's a myth. Um, except maybe for you, 
because some people, dairy does in, in fact increase mucus, uh, mu mucosal production, the epithelial layers tend to um, uh, produce a little bit of extra material for you that, that's thicker and might um, interfere with, with singing. But in general, dairy is not going to cause you to have a bad singing experience. Um, I know people that have yogurt and ice cream and milk um, before they sing with absolutely uh, uh, no effect whatsoever. Obviously, you want to monitor your alcohol and caffeine intake. Those are both diuretics. They will dehydrate you, um, uh, not to mention, you know, the cognitive side of side effects. Some people, uh, that's not an issue, uh, but there are physiological changes to the body with alcohol and caffeine that will affect the efficiency of the vocal mechanism. Food sensitivities, obviously some folks have food sensitivities that cause histemic reactions for them. For me, it's melon. I cannot eat any kind of melon before I have to sing because it causes some sort of strange histemic reaction and it's, 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 I need to take Benadryl or something and, and, or, or some other antihistamine when that happens for me, but it does affect my vocal folds in a, in, in a, in a way that reduces the, the um, elasticity. Carbs or protein when you sing? For me, it's, it's a little bit of both. I try to balance carb and protein before I sing. Some folks carb load, some folks um, need protein. I think your body type will help determine um, what you need um, as a singer before you sing, but there's no hard and fast rule. Diets and the voice. You should, of course, if you're, if you're um, considering some sort of um, weight loss or weight gain program, you should be consulting with your medical professional, but there are, um, there are some diets that will uh, change the way your voice um, uh, reacts. Um, I recently lost a lot of weight and have discovered that my voice is working much better. Um, uh, so uh, it's not due to the diet, it's due to the weight loss, but it's, it's, it's something that um, I have benefited from. Soda, carbonated beverage, juices, again, all of those things have substances in them that will interact with your body. Um, seltzer water, uh, I love carbon, I love um, the Spindrift um, um, carbonated beverages because it's basically carbonated water and a little bit of, of, of unsweetened fruit juice, and that works really well for me. Soda, probably not such a good idea. The caffeine and the bubbles, the bubbles, the, ca the um, carbonation actually makes the, allows some of, this, some of the caffeine to pass into the bloodstream more quickly. So it's uh, probably best to avoid sodas uh, before you sing. Uh, moving along, just checking the time here, make sure I'm doing all right. We are, we're doing great. Hoarseness and laryngitis. Horses and laryngitis are can not. With, uh, yep. a, 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 a timed a timed question, I think. Yep. Um, and I'll make myself this for that. Um, uh, two things about hydration, since it was so important. Since it is so important, I want to make sure we get it close on. One is: is there a difference for instrumentalists that you know of? I guess it would depend on your instrument. Um, um, you know, the intraoral air pressure is different for brass players than it is for uh, different among brass players, I would guess. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I don't know. Does a timpani player need to be more hydrated than a, than a, than a trombone player? Um, uh, I think that hydration in general is good for cognition. It's, it's good for respiration, right? If the, if the, if the, um, if the lung tissue is fully hydrated, you're going to get a more in efficient interact gas interaction between the the uh, cardiovascular system and the respiratory system. So I would say yes, hydration is is vital for instrumentalists as well, because okay. it will increase the efficiency of the of the instrument of your body. As regards the 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 water intake uh, aspect, uh, is there a difference in uh, pre-rehearsal versus pre-reformance? Is there a different liquid you'd recommend for one variety or the other? Um, uh, you know, experiment for yourselves so that you know what, what, what will work for you. My practice is that if I'm doing rehearsal work, I'm just drinking straight water. But if I'm under performance, if I'm in a performance where there's a lot of lights, like if I'm on a big stage with a lot of lights and I sweat a lot when I'm singing on a stage, I will put Pedialyte in my water for sure 
because I know I'm going to be dehydrating and losing electrolytes when I'm under stage lights. So uh, that's, I don't know if that answered the question. I think we're good. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Should we move on, Gary? Sure. All right, I'm going to try this again. Let's see if this will work. Uh, what's going on here? We want... Um, um, are we good? We're good. Okay. Gary, is this the right slide? Can you see the slide? Uh, looks perfect. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, hoarseness and laryngitis are not the same thing. Hoarseness is the symptom. Laryngitis is the problem. It's the illness. It's the, um, uh, it's the process that's happening to your vocal mechanism. Um, generally, when we talk about laryngitis, we're talking about vocal fold swelling or inflammation. If you remember that slide a few, a few back where you could see the, the inflammation, the vascularity, the increase in vascularity and the swelling along the edges of the vocal mechanism. There are generally three causes um, for that kind of swelling. Or there, there are uh, several causes for that swelling, including chemical, mechanical, or my favorite is thermal. The overheating of the voice um, is a feature of that vocal load that we were talking about earlier. So if you're using, it's like being, it's like being in fifth gear or uh, uh, a low gear for a very high, uh, long period of time. Um, it's important to uh, be aware of which of these three things or the, the including illness, which is not listed here, that can be causing um, that inflammation uh, so that you can reduce, eliminate or address um, address those. By chemical, you know, if you um, some of us live with a smoker, um, uh, some of us uh, go to places that might be smoky. Um, I remember several years ago when the fires were really bad in eastern Washington driving from Walla Walla to Seattle and um, losing my voice in the process because of inhaling the, the smoke um, from that drive. Uh, GERD, laryngeal reflux. So I want to talk a little bit about laryngeal re reflux. Um, a lot of singers, a lot of singers, and myself included, take a meprazole to help reduce the amount of acid um, that, that, that may potentially affect our vocal folds. In, in, in GERD or laryngeal re reflux, there's actual stomach fluid containing the, the, uh, the stomach acids that, that, touch it, that, can, um, that touches the vocal folds. And it's very rare. It is actually only about 18% of people that, um, that uh, um, are uh, seeking treatment for um, laryngeal reflux that actually have the problem where, there's, uh, uh, where it affects the vocal folds themselves. It does need a doctor's um, diagnosis. Sometimes people go out and they just start taking the omeprazole, which you can get over the counter, and it works. It works. It does work. Um, uh, but it, it's not necessarily the, the actual problem of laryngeal reflux. Laryngeal reflux can be really serious and you can have long-term damage to the vocal folds um, if, you have, if you have untreated laryngeal reflux. If you feel like you have something coming up all the time in your voice, it's probably important to go seek a uh, doctor. Cold flu, post-nasal drip are three of the biggest causes of hoarseness uh, of, uh, and, and laryngitis. Um, those are all examples where you want to take it easy on your voice, right? Um, and then uh, treatment for major illnesses are, is also a place where we experience changes um, um, uh, to the larynx. Um, there are some kinds of cancer treatments. There are other major illnesses, radiation, um, where I've observed in my studio practice, folks that have side effects from other medications, um, that, um, that experience dryness in general um, and hoarseness as a result of, of uh, treatment. So again, that's a time when your voice professional is going to want to work alongside you and your physician to make sure that the approach in the studio or um, in rehearsal is, uh, is the right one for you and that supports your health and wellness. Environmental issues, dust and pollen. We have just gone through alder season and cedar and we are now entering uh, Scotch Broom. I have an app on my phone 
that tracks pollen. Every, and I, I get up every day and I check the pollen count, partly because I need to talk to my students about that every day, um, because we, I have, we all, many of us suffer from allergies. Um, uh, using um, uh, a saline spray like this one, um, uh, that can, you, I'm not gonna demonstrate it here, but that helps get some of the, uh, the debris out of the nasal passages. I also keep handy uh, a little nasal sprayer just to moisten the tissues a little bit because sometimes the antihistamines have a way of drying out my nasal tissues. That helps keep me comfortable. Um, and then there's medications. There are s some antihistamines and some uh, uh, sprayed steroids, uh, nasal steroids, uh, that uh, will dry the tissues out and you have to be really careful about hydration. Others can cause fungal infections. If you overuse them, it's best to talk about an allergy uh, strategy or medication strategy with your doctor. And ambient noise is really, really a big thing that we're not aware of. Although many of us are working at home now, and if you're like me, the TV and the stereo are off So there's when, when I'm working, so there's not a lot of ambient noise. However, in uh, when we're out in other in, out in the world, or maybe we do um, have kids at home, or there's there are other things that uh, contribute to environmental noise, it's important to know that we tend to raise our voice to, to communicate and talk over that noise. It adds to vocal load. Singing to recordings in the car, don't keep the volume so loud that you can't hear yourself singing along. And then chemical irritants, we've, we've talked about that. That can be any, any variety of things. Uh, in the in the atmosphere. Throat clearing, which you watched me do, uh, habits in general. Throat clearing is, we all have to do it from time to time. We get a little bit of, uh, of, of extra um, thick mucus in the throat that needs to be cleared. Um, generally, it's a good idea to swallow or hum a little bit. Mm, 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 mm. Or I catch my, I, or I swallow and catch my, catch the, the swallow at the top and hold it and then release as a way to help uh, loosen uh, things in the uh, loosen things up or, or relieve irritation. Tension is the enemy of good singing. We as we as we get older, as we sing for many years, we develop habits as singers. Tongue tension, tension in the face, tension in the body are all the enemy of good singing, of efficient singing. One of the things I use in my studio with my students is before you take that first breath, scan your body for tension top to bottom, including um, making sure that the tongue is released um, and that you have uh, the shoulders relaxed on top of the shoulder, on, on top of the rib cage. If your shoulders are doing the work of pulling the rib cage up, that's gonna tire you out over time and making sure that those sternocleidomastoid muscles, the long muscles of the neck, the superhyoids, all of those muscles are, are released in the, in the, on, on a regular basis um, uh, when, you're, when you're singing so that you reduce the amount of tension in your, in your body as you're singing. Build vocal effect, efficiency, then forget your technique. One of the things that happens often for us is that as we learn technique, we tend to be constantly calculating what to do next with our voice, and that is also very tiring. Um, and it reduces our enjoyment of, of the craft of singing. So once you learn how to sing and you're doing the singing and you're doing the rehearsing, and unless you're working on something very specific, leave the technique to your, um, to your unconscious self um, uh, so that you are communicating the text, so that you're involving your body, your mind, and your mouth um, in, the, in communicating the texts. Know your food sensitivities. We've talked about that. Make substitutions. If something's too high, drop down. If there's um, if there's some um, uh, passage where uh, where you need to take the vowels or the consonants out, find good ways to make substitutions for yourself in the in the course of rehearsal. And then exercise. Your body is your instrument. Exercise is important. Movement is important. Now we we, we don't all have the benefit of being able to. Um, uh, you know, get, you know, go to a gym. We don't all have access to a treadmill. Some of, sometimes our bodies aren't equipped to do those sorts of things. But as much as possible, um, uh, honor, honor, honor the fact that we carry our instrument in our body and to um, uh, always be uh, caring for that instrument. Singing with a mask. And then I think I'm almost done. This is it. Oh, I'm, I'm a little over. Um, singing with a mask. 
First of all, there is no known increase yet that we know of in voice disorders, in dysphonias, in aphonias that result from singing with a mask. So um, there's no harm, no foul that we know of that comes from singing over a long period of time with a mask. So let me remove that fear. Um, uh, Dr. Newman uh, uh, gave us a, a really good study on that. Uh, reduction in certain frequencies depending on materials. So your N95 mask, your halo mask, that, that this is my preferred mask, by the way, um, or that really cool mask that your friend from choir made for you as a singing mask, all of these are made of different materials and these will all have a different effect on the sound that comes out. So they reduce different frequencies. This has a tendency to reduce a lot of highs and a lot of lows. This has a tendency to reduce a lot of mids and this has a tendency to reduce a lot of highs. So um, there's a tendency to over sing with a mask on. You don't need to over sing. Uh, there's a lot of um, um, auditory feedback from the mask that is unusual to us. We're not used to hearing ourselves sing through a mask, so we haven't yet learned how to um, uh, 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 balance the amount the, the, of volume that we're using relative to the amount that we actually need on the other side of the mask. So the other thing that's sort of a neat benefit is that the, the masks tend to increase vocal tract inertance, that what we were talking about back pressure earlier, um, as vocal tract inertance or intraoral air pressure. So it increases glottal efficiency ever so slightly. Um, so uh, we can in fact appreciate a better, uh, a higher amount of energy, acoustic energy coming out of the, of the mouth. So there's, there's a, sort of a com compensatory feature to singing with a mask. Um, I also uh, have read in several places, and it's really kind of a good idea to either change your mask um, or uh, or uh, just change your mask after every 60 minutes of singing because you are there is there, there are a lot of aerosols coming out of your lungs going into these masks and uh, after singing with one put it in the wash put it in your bathroom sink with some wool light um, there is you can uh, one of the um, doctors uh, that I that I know and work work with uses a combination of peroxide and alcohol to sanitize the masks in between use uh, as another layer of protection. Um, and then you know the mask singing mask is it, it's just going to result in healthier choirs. We're all really really hoping to be back in person this fall and. And most of the experts are telling us that we're going to be singing masked for a while at least. Um, so um, I, I hope that you will all um, um, consider well that we're going to have to adopt this new way for, for probably a, a while. Um, and uh, as much as possible not to let it interfere with our enjoyment of, of singing, but to let it be the thing that allows us to come back. That would be my encouragement. So uh, I just want to do a couple quick shout outs. Um, uh, if uh, you don't know about it, there's this phenomenal book called Singing Through the Change, Women's Voices in Midlife Menopause and Beyond. It came out last year. Ooh, that's that, 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 that citation is not spelled correctly, I don't think. Um, but this is a, a, a phenomenal book for women experiencing menopause and perimenopausal uh, symptoms and what, how your voice will function. Um, it's literally been a game changer for voice instruction everywhere. Um, Kari Reagan, who teaches at the University of Washington, a systematic uh, approach uh, to the uh, art of studio application. It's great. You don't have to be a voice teacher to appreciate this book. And lastly, I want to give a shout out to Heidi Moss Erickson, who is my uh, one of my gurus, uh, who teaches at the San Francisco Conservatory of Music, one of the great pedagogues working in the United States right now, along the greats of, of Ian Howell and Ken Bozeman. And she's really advancing the field of vocal pedagogy, particularly where neurology and brain science are concerned. So with that, questions and maybe some videos if we have if we have time.
There are indeed a couple of great questions that, that have come through. I'm going to reorient my camera here, sorry. Um, uh, one is as regards uh, standing versus sitting while singing, and particularly for those who may have an injury and therefore must sit whether they want to or not. Well, I mean, so in general, uh, the body will work the... the, the... So the, the short answer is standing is better to sing. Um, uh, but it's only better to sing if you can swivel your hips and keep the lower part of your body unlocked while you're while you're singing. So um, in general, I tell my I tell my students that you should be able to swivel your hips when you sing. If if the if this mechanism here is locked, if it's locked, like my feet right now are underneath my shoulders and my knees are locked, you're actually reducing the efficiency of all the muscles from here down. And the muscle, the diaphragm only works because of the muscles down here. This is an involuntary muscle. You can't, when someone says, oh, sing from your diaphragm. Well, it's an involuntary muscle, first of all, right? You really need the, the, um, the opposite uh, action of the muscles of the pelvic floor, the psoas muscle and others in order for the diaphragm to do its job correctly. So if you've got your hips locked and, your, and your, your, the lower part of your body locked, you're not getting efficient respiration for, for the vocal mechanism. So making sure that you can swivel your hips and that you can move and all of those things while you're singing is really, really important. So um, that's one half of the answer. The other half is, you know, it's as able. Finding a position that's comfortable for you to sing in, and what I would recommend, some people, some people are really big on, you know, you have to be on the front six inches of the chair. But if you're on the front six inches of the chair, you have to be able to keep your spine as as erect as possible with the skull on top of the head. You have to have the skull, the skull has to be on top of the head to have primary control of the breath. If you're slouching, right? If you're slouching in your chair, if it's easier for you to be in the all the way back in the chair in order to keep your spine erect and your skull on top of the uh, and the skull on top of your spine then you should have your back up against the back of the chair if you're dealing with injuries accommodate your injury as best you can that would be that would be what i would say i really hope wish i had better uh, video editing skills because i want to turn that notion of you swiveling around into a meme you'll you'll yeah. see it everywhere yeah, you know there are voice teachers that will that have that keep hula hoops in their um in their in their voice studios and make people do hula hoops while they're singing so that they can keep the the lower body um, um, active while they're. While they're singing. <laughs> so I've never just done that to my students, but I've had it done to me. Uh, the question that you asked us to return to. Which is when uh, when this individual uh, this individual wrote when I do my straw exercises I find I need to narrow the straw when I go higher. Yeah. If I occlude the straw even more, I can use a whole lot of core strength. Is there a point where that becomes risky? I happen to have Ingo Tite's book right here. So uh, let's see if he does not. Um, I guess the follow-up question would have to be, are you experiencing tension as a result of the change? If, if you are experiencing tension, the answer is you're doing it wrong. That would be wrongly uh, or incorrectly, um, um, uh, because we we're, we're actually wanting to re we want to reduce tension by unpressing the mechanism. So I, I I guess I would have to work with the person to see what that would be. Um, Casey, feel free to email us if you want follow yeah, up. Yeah, absolutely. That. But that's yeah. a great answer, though. I think Scott, if yeah. if it's hurting you, don't do it. Right. And if it hasn't hurt you yet, then apparently it isn't doing harm. Right. 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 So I mean that's I mean that's like the big one of the big rules in in my in in in, in my instruction is if it hurts, stop, right? Now, tension doesn't necessarily mean hurt. So, I, I, and I don't want to identify tension with pain because those are two different sensations. But if it's generating tension in the technique, then it's, then it's not having the effect you want it to have. 
that's where I would go with that. Cool. Do, would you like to show a, a, a bit? Uh, we're over time, maybe not a whole one, but a bit of one of your uh, 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 video surprises. Sure. Many of you may have already seen this, but. Um... So this is the, the glottis here. Pure form, cricothyroid back here. Healthy vocal folds, false folds. This is the soprano, this is the bass. That's just a little bit of fun. I'd like to point out that the tenor was the one who ensured the view was the clearest. I, I think this makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you, Scott. This was fantastic. My goodness, I need to, re even I want to rewatch this one uh, rather soon. Uh, thank you also to all of our participants. We had a lot of questions and contributions today um, and a lot of them overlap just a smidgen. Um, and, and it was fantastic. Thank you for that engagement. Uh, the next offering, of the Emerald Coral Academy will take place on Monday, May 24th, uh, during which I myself will be the presenter. This will be a tell-all event during which I will reveal all the secrets of what conductors really do. You, you can blackmail your conductor uh, with information, I'm sure. I'll, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, all of us at the Emerald Ensemble are grateful for the enthusiasm of you, our audience, and supporters. Uh, as the Emerald Choral Academy continues, you can help to support these efforts by donating at emeraldensemble.org. And you can also let us know of topics that you would like to see discussed in the future. We're already planning a third semester for, for the fall of it. In the meantime, I am Gary Cannon. On behalf of all of the Emerald Ensemble and Scott, um, I wish you good physical, mental, and musical health. Thank you. And I realize we're closed with both of us in